Our Cyclone Gabriella Recovery Task Force is based partly on Queensland's response to repeated floods. So how good is their motto? Environmental historian Margaret Cook is an expert on how human behaviour causes flood hazards and author of a book on the history of flooding in Brisbane. I asked her what the strengths and weaknesses of Queensland's flood response are turning out to be. Um, look, it's done really well. It's better than we've had before. After the 2011 flood we had, we didn't have any such scheme to this scale. So this is a really encouraging start because we're going to be looking at buying back 500 houses, roughly, and we're also looking at uh, some design differences. So it's really good. The problem is it's a great start and it's only going to make a small difference to a small number of people, but we have to start somewhere. Well, yeah, on that, because the fund as it exists has funding for 500 homes to be bought back, but thousands of homes have been destroyed. It seems like a massive shortfall. Yeah, it is. But as I said, we hadn't done it before. So what we're going to do now is move the most vulnerable. And that's a problem because it's going to be the places that get flooded the most frequently and the worst. So it's a start, but there will be lots of people who don't qualify. And that's the problem for the scheme. And it's very disappointing for all those people who miss out. And even for some people who do eventually have the home bought back, your home has to be assessed before it can be bought back. What kind of conditions are people living in while they wait for their home to be assessed? Oh, some people are living in an absolutely appalling conditions and, and that's a really big problem because part of the problem is the scale of this flood. As you mentioned, we have thousands of people affected, a scenario that New Zealanders will be unfortunately equally familiar with. So the task of getting around to assess all of these houses takes a really long time and people are traumatised and trying to make very difficult decisions. They're trying to negotiate with their insurers if they've got them and that's taking a really long time. And we've got an incredible shortage of builders, again, because of the scale and getting building materials. So people are living in squalor is the reality. Some people are actually camping in their houses. Some people are surrounded by mould or, or no walls at all. You know, they're just living in shells of houses and it's very bad for your mental health. Well, on that mental health aspect, is there any mental health support being offered to supplement the economic support? Yeah, one of the things that they did do with the Queensland Reconstruction Authority is recognise the human dimension really early. So they've got a whole lot of social scientists and people working in that sphere, helping people a lot. But it's it, that, again, is very time-consuming and really difficult. So I'm sure there are a lot of people who are suffering a lot. And as climate change ramps up, unfortunately, this is going to happen again in both of our countries. How do we structure our recovery plans in a way that's proactive and avoids just repeating the same situations? Well, this is something I talk about a lot in my research because we are so reactive. The Australian Productivity Commission found that we spend 97% of our funds on recovery, and I really want to change that dynamic. And with climate change, we do know that the cost of this is going to get worse and the economic and emotional and physical costs of doing all of this. So what we have to start doing is firstly, don't build any more houses in the floodplain in these vulnerable areas because we're making that problem worse. And then scale up this program so we move more and more houses because that is really this adaptation process is really the only way that in the long term we'll start making a difference. Well, one contentious issue here, though, is how do you manage people who refuse to leave, who have already built in those flood-prone areas? That's a really big problem, and that's the issue for us because I think a strength of our system is we've made it voluntary. So that's really good. People have been allowed to take their time to work through that process. But what do you do if you've got a street where six of the houses have moved but two haven't? That makes it really difficult to redevelop that space. So I think we've got to have that ongoing process so that when those houses go on the market in the future, we still have some funds to be able to buy them then. So I see this very much as an initial step that needs uh, iterative processes after this event because the problem's not going away. Well, then the kind of proactive programs that you're suggesting are going to be immensely expensive. How realistic is it that governments both in Australia and New Zealand are going to spend the money necessary? Well, again, this is coming back to this proactive thing because I think one of the solutions are if we build the houses properly in the first place, we'll save some money that way. And that means building codes and building materials and so on. So there's that part of the equation. But, yes, the reality is, is both countries are talking about thousands of houses and none of us want to increase our taxes to pay for that. So we've got to try and find a model that adds incremental money to this system because the individual can't wear the cost. And the councils have approved some of this development, so I do think there is an onus on governments to help 
to improve the situation. To localise it for our audience a little bit, many homes were red stickered here following the Christchurch earthquake. Do you think that kind of top-down approach is workable or should it be more bottom-up? Look, the top-down approach is, is never really good for community buy-in. And I think there was a problem in Christchurch. Christchurch was a good system because it, it did respond probably quite quickly, but it probably didn't take that human and individual factor in so well. Queensland also had a system here where we moved to town after the 2011 floods. It was a little town. Again, there was an element of being voluntary in that, and there was a government ballot system where people could move. But the, the new approach that the Queensland Reconstruction Authority is taking is a far more consultative process, and I think that's been a, a better version than the Christchurch version. We do eventually learn from history, and we can learn from each other a lot in this space. And final question, Margaret. Do you think we should be following in your footsteps in our recovery plans, and what would your top advice be to us? My top advice is we know where these vulnerable places are, we know where these vulnerable people live, and they're often the people who can least afford to be able to solve the problems for themselves. So talk to your communities, work really closely with your communities, and start funding the communities to be able to adapt to the climate crisis that we're going to be facing.